Hello out there. It's family read aloud time. It is Tuesday, April 28th. It is 6 p.m. Um, we are getting ready to read more of our book, which we're actually almost at the end of. Um, so we will have to see what happens next. I hope everyone had a good day. At least the sun was out today. Not like yesterday. Yesterday it was so cold. Um, in case you're wondering, I submitted my last thing for the semester. So that's um, good. Although I need to sleep for a little while now <laughs> to rest up from that. But I have a little a couple weeks off um, before I go back to school. Hi, mom. <laughs> um, and we will get into it. We are reading Ida B and her plans to maximize fun, avoid disaster, and possibly save the world by Katherine Hannigan. Um, when we left off, Ida B is still angry. She's still angry about what's going on in her life. Oh, hi, Eric. <laughs> um, and she is, sorry, I'm distracted. Eric, you got mail today, so let me know what you want me to do with it. <laughs> okay. Um, but she's still angry. She's upset that they had to sell that land. She's upset she had to go back to public school. She upset the mom, her mom is sick. And then um, the new family had just moved in and she wanted to scare them away. Um, they had just moved into the house that was built in the land that had to be sold off to pay for the medical bills. Um, Ida B's parents had, 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 had offered her Ida B at dinner um, right before we left off plan a new apple orchard in a different part of the valley. Um, but she stormed off. Then she had woken up feeling really with like this terrible pain and her just feeling bad about storming off on her parents and um, just kind of about her behavior. So we are going to pick up with chapter 24. Here we go. Even if you win a battle, as long as the enemy's got a heart that's beating and a brain that's working, you'd better be prepared for a counterattack. So for the rest of the weekend and the whole bus ride to school on Monday, I was getting ready for Claire and retribution. Claire was smart. She had friends. She was going to find some way. Claire was the girl that had moved in to the new house. Um, but she was smart. She's going to find some way I knew to get back at me for scaring her and her brother. Now, I don't need to explain what happens when a popular and persuasive young woman like Claire Besides, she's going to go after a solitary, no friends to speak of, somewhat rude young woman like myself at a place like Ernest B. Lawson Elementary School. Depending on how clever and cruel Claire was and how much pain she thought I deserved, I was looking at a period of misery and mortification that might last a week or maybe the rest of my life. I tried to think of every possible thing Claire might do, especially the worst, most excruciating ones, and figure out how I could either avoid total pain and humiliation or at least convince myself that it wasn't really that bad. She might call you a name, I warned myself. Then I imagined her saying things to me like, smells like Ida brought the country to school with her. Do you feed the pigs or do you roll around with them too, Ida? In front of about 20 other kids. I practiced saying to myself, I don't care. I don't care if Claire says I stink in front of 20 kids. I don't care if they all laugh at me and make up bad names for me. And in my head, I just turned around and told her over my shoulder, we don't have pigs, Claire. I imagined Claire accidentally on purpose, tripping me as we lined up to go inside from the playground. So all of the classes going in and all of the classes going out saw me lying on the ground, flat on my face, with my arms and legs sticking out like a four-legged starfish, blood pouring out of my knees and elbows, and a bump the size of a melon coming out of my forehead. I don't care if everybody thinks I'm clumsy, I assured myself. Then I pictured myself being very careful and looking out for extended body parts wherever I went. I imagined about 276 different things Claire might do to me and how I might protect myself from utter and complete degradation in all 276 cases. Nobody, I thought, outplans me. When I walked into the classroom on Monday, I kept my head straight ahead like nothing was going on. 
but I scanned the room from the corners of my eyes back and forth like a minesweeper for Claire the Vengeful. I spotted her at her desk, and just at that moment, the sides of both of our eyes met, walked, registered that the enemy was now within striking distance, and then looked away. I walked over to my desk. I discreetly checked my seat for sharp metal objects, then the inside of my desk for chewed bubblegum worms or rotting vegetables. Nothing. I sat down and gave one eye and one half of my brain to Miss W and devoted the other eye and the stronger and more calculating half of my brain to the study of Claire. But the first part of the morning went by without incident or even a hint of retaliation. Claire didn't make faces at me or whisper to her friends and point at me. The only thing that was different was she never looked directly at me. Her face was always turned away from me, like I was the scene of a gruesome accident she couldn't bring herself to even glance at. By 10.30, I decided that she was saving her wallet for recess, where there, there's the least adult supervision, the ability to quickly assemble a mob and many tools for injury. I used the rest of the morning to draw a map of the playground and plan multiple escape routes. The safest spot was still my perch on the steps. If I sat a little closer to the ground, I could go forward, jump off to either side, or if I had time to get them open, disappear behind the big doors. Miss W did her usual check-in and I almost didn't hear or see her. I was watching Claire so carefully using my peripheral vision. Then Ronnie stopped by and for about the 100th time asked me if I wanted to play dodgeball. And for the 100th time I answered, no thanks Ronnie. But this time, instead of whispering it so nobody could hear me talking with somebody in a friendly way, I just said it out loud because I was so preoccupied. Ronnie sensed the change. What are you doing, he asked. Nothing, I said irritably. You're doing something. Now, if I was going to tell anybody anything, which I wasn't, it would have been Ronnie, I think. But if I told him one little thing, like I'm watching Claire, I'd have to tell him many medium and big things, like why I was watching her and what happened over the weekend, too. I wasn't ready for Ronnie to get to know that particular side of me. So I just said, not now, Ronnie. And he looked at me kind of mad for a second and then walked away. But it was better, I figured, to have Ronnie a little peeved than to have me a whole lot damaged and degraded just because I'd let my guard down for three and one third seconds. Claire toyed with me for all of recess, pretending to be up to nothing. By the time we went back to the classroom, I was so tired from watching and planning, I just wanted to put my head down on my desk and take a nap. I suppose that a moment of weakness and fatigue on my part was exactly the invitation to injury she had in mind, though. So I propped my head up in my arm, pinched my thigh about eight times, twisted it hard once, and stayed awake for the rest of the Claire uneventful afternoon. Her genius was beginning to dawn on me. Claire didn't try to get me back on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday either. I was getting exhausted from watching and waiting and planning, and she wasn't revealing a single sign of a plot for my punishment. If she was passing out paper, she didn't crumple mine or throw it on the floor. She'd just place it on my desk while she looked at the coat room. She didn't write notes about me on the lavatory walls, leave slimy things in my jacket pockets, or have her mother call up my mama and discuss my behavior. I was confounded. Truth is, I wanted Claire to retaliate. I wanted her to prove to me, mama and daddy, Miss Washington, and the universe at large that she was completely deserving of a little foul treatment and more. I wanted to be reminded often and obviously that the world needed protecting from people like Claire and it needed me to protect it. Claire was not cooperating. Chapter 25. There was a little idea trying to get my attention and it kept getting bigger every day, even though most of the time I refused to pay it any mind. So it would wait till my guard was down and sneak up to the front of my brain. Then it would start out with small disguised as almost friendly up to nothing and particular questions like, what if Claire isn't quite as completely evil and nasty as you thought I to be? But if I let that idea have any room and gave it any consideration, it would follow up with some bigger, harder questions that were just plain irritating. What if, it would ask, when you scared Claire and her brother, you were yelling at the wrong people about the wrong thing at the wrong time, I to be? Or what if you weren't a big, strong, righteous, conquering hero that Saturday in the woods, I to be? What if you went too far this time? And if I didn't cut it off right there, it would hit me with the big one in spite of me letting it know it was unwelcome. Ida B, it would ask, what if Claire was right and you are just plain mean? I decided that I did not care to respond to that particular question at that particular time. Just because you've made a thought be quiet though doesn't mean you've gotten rid of it. And this thought was clever. It was hidden and silent, but it was ready to attack the minute I left myself exposed and it got me 
where I was most vulnerable. Miss Washington had decided that the guest reader idea was a good one, and she'd been giving other kids the chance to read, including the big-headed one. I liked the idea too, though, because it meant that someday my turn would come around again, and I was itching to have another chance, but I didn't let her know that. So when Miss W said on a Tuesday, about a week and a half after I'd done my part to save the Valley from invasion, you're about due for a turn reading, Ida. How would you like to read the next chapter of our book? I'd had an answer ready for a long time. All right, I decided to say, I'd decided to say, not seeming too excited, but not leaving any room for confusion about my commitment e either. That's what I decided. That's what my mouth was ready to say, and that's what my body was ready to do. But my brain did this instead. It thought about Claire. It thought about that magic that happens when you tell a story right, and everybody who hears it not only loves the story, but they love you a little bit too for telling it so well. Like I loved Miss Washington in spite of myself the first time I heard her. When you hear somebody read a story well, you can't help but think there's some good inside them, even if you don't know them. And I figured the same was true for me, that all of those kids who didn't know me and even Miss Washington, who really hardly knew me at all, might think decent things about me just because I made my voice go up and down, slow and fast, soft and hard while I read. Just because I made that story come alive a little bit for them. But I knew there was someone out there who'd seen a part of me that none of the rest of them had. She would be sitting there hearing my voice stop and start, slide and shake, and she would not be impressed. She would not believe in my goodness just because I could tell a story well. I saw the real Ida, Claire would say. And she was cruel and selfish and bitter like a lemon. She knew I was mean and all of a sudden I did too. And I knew I couldn't read that day. Someone who has a cold, hard rock for a heart and likes it who won't look at people or say thank you, who scares children and doesn't care if they cry, who doesn't mind if the whole world weeps because at least they'd know how it feels too. Well, even if I could read the words out loud and make them sweet and sour, long and short, high and low, all I would be hearing in my own head was, you're mean, and I knew I couldn't bear it. I can't, I don't feel well, I told Miss W. Are you sure? Yes, ma'am, I said to my feet because I couldn't look at Miss W's eyes. Miss W put her hand on my arm. Another time then, Ida. Yes, ma'am, I whispered. My head was so heavy, I had to set it down on my desk. And my body got so cold, I had to wrap my arms around it. My eyes were so tired, I had to shut them tight. So there was just deep blue inside them. Patrice read, and I was glad for the sound of her voice and the blueness. Not so much the words, just the voice. Chapter 26. On Wednesday at recess, Miss W sat down next to me on the steps, just like always. Just like always, she asked me, anything you want to talk about, Ida? No, ma'am, I said right away, because that's what I always did. And thank goodness Miss W's always stayed for a few extra minutes. Because I was thinking that if I didn't talk to somebody pretty soon, all that stuff I'd been holding inside of me was going to burst out screaming, bursting through my outside so it could get some air and find an ear. There would be little screaming pieces of Ida B splattered across windows and kindergartner's hair and landing on top of you're not supposed to eat them outside sandwiches. Miss Washington, I said, yes, Ida. Both of us were looking straight ahead like nobody would think we were talking. Did you ever do something that seemed right at the time but later it seemed kind of wrong? Miss W was waiting, like she was letting me have plenty of space to finish just in case something important came into my head a little late. Yes, I have, Ida, she said after some moments. And we both let the comfort of that settle into me for a bit. Then I asked, did you ever do something because you were really mad, so mad and sad that you just had to try something to make things better? And it seemed perfect at the time, but then later it felt a little wrong? This time, Miss W waited even longer. But now, instead of liking her waiting, I was wondering if she'd realized that maybe she didn't want to be sitting so close to somebody like me. Yes, I have, she finally said. When I peeked at her face out of the corner of my eye, she looked sad. Now I took a pause because the big one was ready to come rolling out, but I was afraid to say it out loud so someone in the world would hear it and know it and it would be real. My insides were still rumbling though and I knew I needed to say it or next thing it'd be Ida B's flesh and bone confetti raining down in the schoolyard. If you ever do something because you were so angry and upset, you were just boiling inside and you had to let it out and it seemed like a good idea at the time, but after a while it didn't feel so good and what you did, well, it it. Now I was looking real, real hard at the blue house across the street, not even seeing a bit of Miss W at the edge of my eyeball. 
It made people cry and they think you're mean. My voice was catching and cracking, so I let it rest for a second. And you didn't really want to hurt anybody. I went on a little quieter. You just wanted the bad things to stop. I took a deep breath and looked down at my shoes and everything else that needed to be said tumbled on out of me. And after you did it, you didn't tell anybody else. And now you feel like a sink that's backed up and it's full of dirty water and cat hair and old whiskers. And if somebody doesn't get the plunger pretty soon, that nasty old water is going to overflow onto everything. Now, that was just about the longest question I ever asked, and it took me a minute to catch my breath when I was all through. As soon as those words were out of me, though, right away, I had a better feeling than I'd had in a while. That space in my chest that my heart used to fill was feeling warmer and a bit more crowded than it had in a long time, and I liked it. But I was also still scared about what Miss W might be thinking and waiting for her to say something. I was looking at her sideways, worrying a lot. I watched her put her elbows on her knees, then she put her hands together so they hugged each other. Her head dropped down and she pushed the right toe of her shoe back and forth, just like Ronnie. Ida, she said, dark and slow like the water at the bottom of a river. I have done something very much like that. Well, I was so relieved because Miss W understood and she was still sitting there next to me. that all of a sudden it felt like my heart was light and free and rising up and taking me along with it. I only got about two inches off the ground though and then I landed right back on that concrete again. Because when I looked at Miss W full on, she was staring at her blue hook at the blue house, but her face was tired and sad and she looked about 10 years older in 10 seconds time. She was remembering and then I was remembering too. The sadness came back over me and I knew I had to say something else or we'd both be stuck in that sadness with each other until at least the end of recess and maybe for always. What did you do about it? I asked. Miss W looked at her clasped hands like there was an answer inside there if she could only get them to open up. Well, Ida, she said, low and calm and sure, like the deepest knowing, I just had to say, I'm sorry. And that was it. That was all she said. All either of us said for the rest of recess. She sat there beside me, both of us looking out, blinking every once in a while, and I let what she said to me settle into my heart. After a couple of minutes, a piece rolled out from that place into every part of me, so even my head felt light and a tiny bit dizzy. When the bell rang, we both jumped a little. Miss W put her hands on our knees and raised herself up. Well, she said, let's get back in. Yes, ma'am, I said, standing up too, both of us still looking straight ahead. We walked back to the room with her a little bit in front of me. I could feel the breeze her body made on my face and I could smell peanut butter and summer flowers. Chapter 27. Right away, I started planning. I would apologize, I decided, but I had not abandoned my resolve to avoid any possible pain or public humiliation at Ernest B. Lawson Elementary School. That meant quick. That meant no friends, classmates, teachers, parents, brothers, or supermarket cashiers nearby or within earshot. It meant multiple escape routes and backup plans. Now, say there were one million possible ways Claire could respond to, I'm sorry. And say 50% of those possible responses were kind, decent ones, like, that's okay, Ida, no problem. But one, well, out of all of those thousands and thousands of friendly, cordial, or just plain tolerant replies Claire might give me, I could only think of three, and I didn't believe a single one of those three would happen. I didn't have any trouble thinking of the bad responses, though, the ones where crowds laughed, body parts disappeared, or foul-smelling, rotting things kept turning up in my personal belongings. You're a snake, Ida Applewood, I could hear Clay, Claire say in front of a crowd of hundreds. A slimy, green, sleazy snake, so go slither back to your hole and swallow some worm-filled mice that are carrying a deadly disease so you get it and your skin turns green and shrivels up. Your eyes bulge out and explode, and you die the most hideous, painful death imaginable. No, I have no problem thinking of the bad ones, and since most of the bad ones involve some kind of complete and horrible degradation in front of large groups of adults and children, my first priority was figuring out a way to get Claire alone. But you're never alone at school, never, except for maybe a couple of seconds. Definitely not in the classroom or on the playground, in the office, the auditorium or the gym. Even in the laboratory, there's almost always a first grader with a small bladder who's, who just has to go at the same time as you. Only the custodian's closet promised privacy, but that meant sealing a key and kidnapping Claire, closing the door without her screaming her head off, somehow convincing her not to tell on, tell on or pummel me, and fitting an apology in there too all in less than five minutes. After carefully considering my options I, options, I decided that the laboratory was my best chance for success. 
only two people could go at a time. And if I could work it, so those two people just happened to be me and Claire. And if at that moment, the small bladdered people just happened to be in the gym or the lunchroom, I might be able to achieve an instant of utter aloneness with her. Just enough for a quick, I'm sorry. At the sink or better yet in the stall next to her, I'd say with that metal partition between us, Claire, who's that? Ida, what do you want? I'm sorry about the day in the woods. And then I'd be done. She could slam the door, flush the toilet till it overflowed, spit under the partition. I wouldn't care. I'd have done what I needed to. And I'd be on my way back to the classroom. And that's where we're going to leave off for today. We are going to finish this book tomorrow. We have a few more chapters to read. Um, and I'll be excited to finish it up with you tomorrow. And then we will hopefully I'll have an announcement during our next our reading tomorrow night um, about our next read aloud story. I have some ideas, but I'm going to zero in on one. Um, so tomorrow at six, we will finish up Ida B. Um, tomorrow at four, I have story time. And the Island Free Library has recently created a YouTube channel. Um, I'm still figuring out how that works, but it would be helpful if people would go to it and subscribe to it. Um, you can find it'll it'll be able to keep track of our programming a little more organized. Um, I'll still be on Facebook for the time being. Um, but if you want to go to the Island Free Library YouTube channel and subscribe to it, that would be great. That can get us some more visibility with that. Um, and there are some more other options and opportunities we can use that platform for. Um, so that it's not all on Facebook. So it's not like our announcements can stand out. Um, if you have, if you <laughs> had a chance to look at the virtual escape room I put up yesterday, um, that was made by two librarians in North Providence, it's really fun. And it's okay if you haven't read the books that they're talking about, because um, you always get more chances. Um, and it was just fun and entertaining. So take a look at that. That is on our Facebook page. Um, and it has to do with the Rhode Island Children's Book Award nominees. You might find a new book you're interested in checking out. Because um, you can look at, look for them on eZone, um, which you can get through the library website and download them. Um, I know you can't check out the physical materials, but there are copies of them on eZone or if you have Libby. Um, that's another app for that has access to the Ocean State Libraries catalog as well. Um, so it's just an option and you might find some new stories you might want to check out just from doing the escape room. I'd love to know if you tried it out, um, what you thought. I am going to work on creating my own, but this is a good try. It was a good for me to try it out myself um, and give it a shot. It, won't, it doesn't take too long. Um, and it's just a fun activity. So let me know if you try it out. Um, and I'm going to sign off for tonight. I will be back at four tomorrow for story time and six for the ending of Ida B tomorrow. Okay. Okay. I hope you all have a good night. Okay. Bye.